crying in the night because of the sound of the bombs. I mean, that, that's a terrible feeling. No, none of us deserve to go through these feelings, neither the Iraqis or the Americans or anyone. Kicking out Saddam was a good thing, but the way they did it, it wasn't the right way. Do you guys really think that what your army did here in Iraq was the ideal solution for the problems that Iraq has been suffering from under Saddam's regime? Was it the ideal solution? A war? We just hear promises. Now we are without electricity. We are living just like another century. Has the war affected your lives? Compared to your life, our life hasn't really changed. And for that reason, we don't... You know, I don't know what to say. There wasn't supposed to be a war because you can't punish 26 million people for one person. Saddam is not Iraq. You can't punish Iraq for Saddam. That's not right. For me, my problem is that I don't know what to do. I would love to help you. I would love to do something, but I don't, I can't. Like, alone, I can't do anything. Why do you think Bush came to Iraq? Bush came to Iraq because he felt like Saddam Hussein was dangerous. Why is all the ministries destroyed except the Ministry of Oil. I think that makes sense because the economy is based on petroleum. I mean, Don't try we need, to twist things. We, you know, the oil supply needs to be, you know, protected. Just the oil just supplies? For, Do you think oil is just the most important thing? Well, economic resource, that's, it's, it's necessary to build. More important than people? Your cousin has been killed by these American soldiers. All these holes have been through him, full of holes. I mean, just look, the blood, look. <laughs> You're losing someone you love? He's my cousin. He's not very cheap. He's so expensive for me. My cousin became a cost of war, so he's the cost of a freedom. Do you feel that you have freedom now? No. Well, some sort of freedom. No. At least. Are you guys mad at the American kids or people like us? Do you hold us responsible? No, we're not, of course, of course because not we got you guys, nothing to do no. with this. You know, some guys are saying the war is over now. Only one side of the war was over. It's a war of bombs. The civilian war just started now. Here in America, because we're not suffering like you guys, it's very easy to forget the huge suffering that you went through. And even I forgot the huge suffering that you guys went through. And I want to say I apologize. We said that this is a bridge from Baghdad to New York. What are you going to do to help us to build this country? What are we going to do together? So that was a clip from a show called Chat the Planet that aired around the world in 290 million homes. Globally, I'm Lori Meadoff, one of the exec producers of Chat the Planet. And one of the things, remember the young one who said, um, I want to apologize for not realizing what you had gone through? Well, in the first show, he was like, We have to bomb the heck out of the Iraqis. We have now, you know, the J Lo looking girl that was beautiful, Hamsa. So all of a sudden, through a satellite television, we notice he's going, I thought you, he's, how do I, okay. He says, I thought you're, uh, you didn't have electricity. How'd you get your hair like that? And all of a sudden, there was this bomb, bond of uh, flirtation happening across worlds. So Chat the Planet was a, a thing I found actually out of South Africa while on a Rockefeller Fellowship with Jacqueline Novogratz. Many of you know the Acumen Fund. And what blew my mind from that was on a TV set at nighttime in Soweto, young people through technology were talking to kids in Philadelphia asking what kind, of language, what kind of dances you do, can you show me? And I said, you could do this two-way technology, and this was a while ago, this was before. I mean, we were using ISDN lines, we were using satellites. And as a woman entrepreneur, and as an entrepreneurpreneur, I don't accept no for an answer. So I went back, found the money, and created this, and 300 and almost 50 million homes actually went through this. So 
When we connected and chat the planet, we connected South Africa to America, Australia, Jordan, and we connected um, uh, in Baghdad right before the initial bombs started and right after. And one of the things I remember most when I was in college was taking an education class and read somewhere, it said, you can say what is a blind person, and you could say it's a person who cannot see. But alternatively, you could say, close your eyes and try to find your way out of this room. And I thought, oh my gosh, I want to do that. I want to feel different cultures. I want to feel life. I want to feel history. And how do we create safe places in our work, either through technology, through media, to get people to actually experience each other? So with that, one more story about chat. We're in Armand Jordan, height of the war. A young satellites, you know, two different locations, two full-time cameras. One young person says, you know what? My grandmother was killed by a soldier. She was just trying to save a five-year-old, Armand Jordan. The American said, well, yo, man, my brother's in Kuwait. And every single time a door opens, I think he's going to blow up. And there was silence. Middle of filming, silence. You know why? Because humanity walked right in the room. And what I have realized that drives me to absolutely not accept no, whether I am building the City Kids Foundation, a multicultural youth organization, or working with Fran Drescher on creating 20,000 home parties, having women understand cancer in their lives and prevention, or if it was Chat the Planet, or being on the Brookings Institute, or wherever I have traveled, it is because at the heart of my soul is a passion value. And I think us, as we as entrepreneurs, drive with a passion value. And mine is, what if everyone knew everyone? This is where chat aired. What if everyone knew everyone is what I hold sacred. And every single time when I've tried to break down why I keep building and where is no not an option, I realize that there are some things I go through all the time in creating something. One is, I think differently. I think creatively, but I think differently. So it's not just what problem I'm, I'm solving. It's what has never been done in quite that way before. The second is, where's that elegantly simple idea? You know, it's a very crowded cancer field in America. There's a National Cancer Association, blah, 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 Lance Armstrong. But we came up with trash cancer as prevention and got Humana behind it. And again, not accepting no, we pulled all these pieces together and even dropped a bipartisan bill in Congress for a carcinogen-free label program. All from this thing about bringing people together. So another thing in building, so um, is content rules. Art is art is art. Doesn't stop. Content, story driven. Now with YouTube having 100 hours of downloadable material per minute, per minute, how do you process that? And how do you and our work get seen in such a crowded space? How do you rise to the top? How do you play strategic ball? And how do you do it that's never been done and differently? I'm going to tell you a story about that. And uh, my last part that I love is if the doors are locked, climb out the windows. And if the windows are locked, go up the chimney. And I'm sure many of you entrepreneurs can relate to that. Um, I found out recently that there was a study to be done about what was the most dangerous word in history. Do you know? What is the most dangerous word? This was from a 2012 study on words can impact your brain. Do you know what it was? Guess. No. They actually put people in an MRI, and they, they took pictures, and all of a sudden the stress hormones started, neurotransmitters went crazy, and no was actually a word that literally affected your brain waves, your appetite, your being, your essence. No. Now, how many times in a day do you say no to your kids, to your family, to yourself? And to really try to understand that when you look at women and you look at add no to the gender issue, it's a cocktail for disempowerment unless you start playing ball very, very differently. And one of the things also that was most recently at a SOCAP conference that I read that I found fascinating and we were just discussing it on the women's panel is that 
um, they, they took a group and they tested them in a data for a while and they found out that still, when women were founders, it was harder to receive the first investment dollars. And the second was that when they did receive it though, the profits were higher. Now I could send that around, but that data just came out and I found for this conference it being really interesting. So back into this, when you look at um, this whole study and you look at what happened, and I'm going to go back to the story and how it really was an example of disrupting. While we're in Baghdad, we realize that the life of the everyday Iraqi is the greatest untold story of the war. And again, a passion value in my heart that I held that made me say, no, it's not an option. We had to tell the story. We found the money. We raised a couple of million dollars. We had the young people of Iraq working with us. Do you know we worked with a group of producers we never met? Cross worlds late at night on the internet, talking to them. Houses blowing up, fearful through the night, waiting and, and finding out that they were okay. Family check-ins. We had never met them. Americans didn't even know what to do when I finally brought them over. It was like, are we allowing you in this country or not? I'm not sure which side we're on. I mean, that was the customs guy, seriously. It was very funny. They had no clue. Meanwhile, hometown Baghdad became the thing that we wanted to build. Eight half hours we had already. I had the editors put together, great team. No one would touch it. Nobody in America would touch it. They were scared, it was too risky, um, just wouldn't do it. So one of the things we did is um, one of my board members looked at me and he said, Lori, you're pushing. Stop pushing. Create the pull. Create the pull. And that's another thing, another element of listening so deeply. Pulled my office together and I said, all right, guess what? Stop the presses. We are totally taking this apart. We are going to take this incredible eight hour, half hour television shows and we're going to make three minute clips. And we're going, to, we're going to send it out on the internet and we're going to do 38 of them. And I turned to my assistant and I said, can I work for you for a little while? Will you figure this out? There's no marketing budget, but you're really, really smart in the tech side too. And he and a team of young ones put together an ideal plan. We got the Huffington Post against Salon.com in a 24-hour exclusive, went with Salon. We got already lined up 150 political bloggers that were the first to market on the distribution of this. They held, a, a, they held an interest. And I'm telling you, in two seconds, the push-pull happened, and I caught lightning in a bottle. We were on the front page of the LA Times, London Times, Argentine, uh, papers, world press, we were on, the kids were on Nightline. It just, all of a sudden the office became a press hub because the life of the everyday Iraqi was being heard. And the emails that came in, I thought, before watching this, I thought you were all insurgents. I didn't think about uh, playing ball with dad. I didn't think of normal kids in an abnormal setting. Over and over again we heard this. And it really did blow up. But the most important thing that happened for me, and when you talk about our work and the opportunities to, that exist as entrepreneurs to also not only build products, but build products that dive deeper with each other, that allow the humanity in our lives to come in, that's a young one from San Francisco who came in and said, um, I want to connect with Saif, the one on the TV show, I mean on the internet show, can I have his number? I heard he moved to Syria. And he went and lived on his couch for a summer. So think about it, creating media that creates empathy, where a new kind of leadership is done, where people really connect across the world. And that's the story of hometown Baghdad. Now one more piece that I want to end with that I just find completely amazing. I got an email from Syria recently that said, look at when you throw something in the, in the water, the ripples that go out are so, so extraordinary. And look most recently what Coca-Cola, and I'm not endorsing Coke, and I'm not here sponsored by Coke, but look what they did do. Can we show that clip? One that has seen a lot of 
it's stressful, it's tense, it's been the traffic going in and getting worse. So we have 60 years that we have been a bar and before that we were living for our homies together. And we all try to go away. Can you feel good about that when we go to the countries? It's the only thing that we have neighbors that we want to go visit. Yeah, so that's true. Okay, we've been doing it and we're going to have to actually meet you. You're not even more than psyche. Mainly because there's no communication. They're near us, but we have no access to them. And it's bad. So we realize that we would do one. when humanity walks in the room. Oh, and I forgot the punchline. We did get National Geographic and Sundance to come by the chat series afterwards. Thank you very much.